Welcome everyone to today's Lectora Live. My name is Stephanie Ivick. I'm the Content Marketing Manager here at eLearning Brothers. We have a really great session planned for you today, but first I'll just go over a couple housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded. We'll send the recording out via email to everyone who registered, and it will also be on our YouTube channel. We have closed captions enabled. You can turn those on for yourself in your Zoom toolbar at the bottom of the window. We also have live chat and a questions panel. So if you have any questions for Bill about today's webinar content, just put them in the questions panel. We'll get to as many as we can throughout the webinar. If we run out of time, we will reach out to you offline afterwards. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Bill Milstead, our senior developer. Thank you very much. I was on mute there and forgot. Apologies. Oh, Zoom. So uh, welcome, everybody, to another Lector Alive. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at a few new wireframe interactions that we have up on our library. Uh, just kind of going over them uh, pretty quickly, um, you know, how we built them, how we can use them, show you, show you those in a, in a uh, particular uh, course starter that we've also got coming out. So a bit of a bit of a preview for what's um, down the pike in about a week or so as well, same time. Um, it's going to be uh, pretty informal today, and, and frankly, it may end up being pretty quick, right? Um, when we do these kind of, you know, real fast kind of technical overview um, webinars, uh, you know, unless there's a lot of interaction, a lot of times it's me just kind of walking through and, and you know, piece kind of stepwise showing, showing you what's going on. Those tend, tend to flow pretty fast. So uh, take that as an encouragement um, to stop if you would like me to and ask some questions, um, you know, kind of talk about what we've done or, or uh, uh, provide any comment or, or feedback on what you're looking at. Um, so uh, that all being said, I'm just gonna hop right on into it, start sharing my screen here and um, get a quick peek at what, we, what we've got coming on. Okay. Let me share my entire screen here. And I'm gonna hop over uh, and kind of look at another monitor. So you might see the side of my head for a bit, but I'll keep, I'll keep peeking back when it makes sense. Um, so uh, what you're looking at on my screen right here um, is actually just a, a quick kind of a preview publish output of a few of these wireframes that we're gonna look at real fast. Um, now I say wireframes, but here they're actually finished. Um, what I've done is I've taken these, these template files from the library uh, and I've applied just a minimal amount of style to them very rapidly. Um, I put all of these that we're gonna look at in the design uh, format together this morning, just to kind of see how fast I could do it before this, um, mostly to, to you know be able to kind of talk about that aspect of it, right? How, how rapid it is, um, or, or you can put some of these things together, okay? Um, so the first thing that we're gonna look at right here, uh, we've got a vertical scrolling um, wireframe layout that we've, we've put out on the, the library. Again, I'm gonna get in depth into those uh, each in just a minute. Um, but it looks like this when you've actually got it nice and styled out in a finished course. Um, you've seen us do some similar things to this in the past with a custom showcase piece. Um, but now what we've actually done is templatized it so that you can, like I'm saying, very rapidly apply this type of a layout with these types of animations and triggers uh, into your course, you know, easy peasy. So as I keep scrolling down, you'll see, right, we've got content that kind of progressively reveals, uh, you know, in a more kind of a web flow uh, format, a lot, a lot more like a modern web experience than a standard click to reveal slide would be. The second interaction that I've got pulled up here, again, we're going to break each one of these down in a wireframe format in just a moment. Um, unless I've got a flip card up on screen. This is something new for us with Lectora. Um, I've teased a little bit about these things in the past, but now again, we've got, we've got versions of them out there for you that you can, you can use as a template in your course. Uh, this particular one is a vertical flip, but we also have a horizontal flip. Um, as well as a dark and a light version. That's not so much applicable here because we're seeing it more finished out. The third one that we've got here, uh, and there's gonna be two variations on something like this. This is a vertical timeline template. That is a, it's also a, a progressive reveal template. So as you scroll down the page, content is gonna bubble up uh, and reveal as you move. Um, so you see the date kind of reveals itself as well as a date block. And as we keep going down, that continues to occur. Okay. 
All right, all the way through 2022. And I've just got some nice, you know, images in the background, mostly just to kind of kind of fill fill your eye. All right. Next one that we're going to take a look at, we have built out a carousel interaction now for Lectora desktop. And all of these will be coming to Lectora online, except for those that are vertical scrolling. Um, those are just be for Lectora desktop. This particular carousel interaction uh, has six cards to it, um, and each one of those are laid out a little bit differently in this example. Um, you got obviously a forward and a back arrow on either side, and you notice if you notice the kind of the content updates based on where you're at in the interaction automatically. It keeps track of your uh, rotation through these groups and will automatically loop back to the top or the bottom, depending on where you're at, as you would hope a carousel would do. Uh, but the cool thing about this one, when we get to it, I'm gonna show you, it's actually, it's driven by a variable off screen so you can preset how many groups you're actually working with. All right, another one here, we've got a vertical timeline template. It's a click to reveal. It's a little bit of a different variation of these kind of vertical ones that we've been showing you here. Um, this one, you know, is a little bit more active, right? So instead of scrolling down the page and having content progressively revealed, you click on it and it shows you what's important for that particular date. And the last thing we'll show you here on the bottom, see this little edit icon I've got down. This is one that I really like and I'm, I'm pretty happy about. Um, I've also teased this in the past before, but now it's up on the library for you to use uh, and, and do cool stuff with. And that is a student notes widget that we've added to the library. So this is a, an element that you can drag and drop into the top of your course. It persists throughout your course, global element, uh, and users can at any point go in, click an edit button, say, I want to add some notes. save those notes and then at any point later they can come back to those notes see what they said now you notice at the same time we've got notes for vertical timeline that auto gets it gets auto appended to the top of that note it's just picking up the name of the page as you have it in lectora uh, to save a little bit of work uh, for you as a developer and also it you know helps the students keep nice and organized with their notes another cool fun little feature about that it's got a little print button in there for you that uh, when you click it, it's gonna wrap up all those student notes that are captured and send them straight to your printer, save it as a PDF, print it out, whatever you wanna do. All right, so, so those are the interactions, just kind of you know, top level that we're gonna, we're gonna be breaking down and looking at how we built today. Let me show you those in tool. Now, I'm gonna show them to you in a couple ways, right? So I did just show them to you in a finished version. I, I do wanna show them to you as the wireframe in the template library so that you can see how they came in and where we ended up, um, but we'll bro break them down probably in the, the finished version um, as we go. So this vertical scrolling timeline, right? Looks like this in the page, you guys saw that previewed. Um, what that actually is, if I go over to my tools panel over to the left or the right hand side and I get into the wireframes portion of our e-learning uh, templates library, right? So when you, you hit the uh, Lector e-learning templates page here, you can scroll down a little bit. We've got this wireframe templates section hanging out. Uh, if you click view more, you'll get a full list of all of these quote unquote wireframe things that we have in our library. Okay. Now, if you don't know what those are, if you're if you're unfamiliar, um, we've got you know a bunch of different types of interactions. Obviously, that we provide in the library, we've got full course starters. We've got designed, you know, finished standalone uh, interactions. We've got frameworks for you know setting up with a particular learning model for your course. But we also have these wireframe things. And what these are are all of the programming and none of the style for common interactions that we, we use, right? So um, what's here in this library feeds a lot of the standalone templates that we have, but uh, you get access to it without all the stuff wrapped around it that may or may not fit your brand. All you actually have to do is you, you get onto this particular page, you find the interaction you want and press download and grab an AWO. We, we tend to put these up as AWOs you could use an AWP, but for a wireframe, something like this, I tend to think that an AWO is a, is a, is a 
kind of the right format because it'll dump straight into your course wherever you want. Um, and the way that these are set up, if you happen to have anything that is um, um, global or, you know, kind of a common design element up at the top of your project explorer, that's obviously going to inherit on down and these should still um, you know, kind of fit nicely within your project. Um, so uh, another thing to note about those, um, I, I grabbed the wrong one, didn't I? That's okay. Another thing to note about those, um, they use um, kind of common variables in some cases, but that actually works out nicely because we've set those up for you in a way that they'll reset themselves if you are using uh, uh, you know, an interaction multiple times over the course of your course. So we tried to you know, set these up in a way that you can save, uh, reuse, kind of reduce your overall you know, legwork with, with interaction development going through this. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say about them is that um, the, the majority of these, except for obviously the, the vertical scrolling ones, will not work in this way. Um, they're designed to work with our style packs uh, and our you know, built-in themes if you're currently using those in any of your projects. So some of our wireframes down toward the bottom that are a little bit older, especially, um, these will align directly to a particular style pack layout. So you can drag in your uh, chosen wireframe, apply a style pack layout through the tool to it if you so choose, uh, and you get kind of an auto magic, you know, uh, uh, design, you know, almost finished layout right there. With a little bit of extra tweaking, changing some images and colors, you're in a good spot. So let's look at that. Um, the first interaction that I showed you was actually this vertical scroll timeline. Uh, takes advantage of one of Lector Desktop's new uh, triggers, which is on enter or on you know scroll out of view. Um, we can choose to throw any number of, of uh, actions at that point, right? So so that's what this entire interaction is based on. Um, doesn't use very much beyond that, truthfully. It's uh, using as much in the box stuff as we possibly can. When you get it into your course, it's going to look like this, right? It's just uh, kind of some minimally styled objects. We've got some text boxes and some date uh, objects right here on the screen. And scrolls on down to the end of the page, and that's about it, right? Um, from here, if you if you wanted to just leave the content as is and get it going up to where I showed you previously, it really would just be a matter of adding design elements into the background, like images, changing colors, things like that. Um, oops, I still grabbed the wrong one, didn't I? Uh, <laughs> this is my fault. Um, it's really just a matter of kind of so some simple design editing to get it up to the state um, that I showed it to you at previously. Uh, or you can go in and do some real heavy changing if you so choose. I'm going to show you how it works now so that you can kind of see how that works or see how, uh, how I made edits to, to what I've got here um, on screen, right? Versus what it comes in at. Basic instructions are, are pretty simple, right? Um, each shape is just a standard shape. You click it to change the date. Go up to your style pane to make style changes. You know, just like you would any other object. You're not constrained to anything. Set your outline color, set your fill color, set your text. All the stuff you would expect. Um, all background objects are native in, in tool, so you can change those rather easily. If you want it to be a sharp corner versus a rounded corner, there you go. Uh, and same thing with text boxes, right? You can move, rearrange, expand, do whatever it is that you so choose. But if you do that in this particular interaction, um, we kind of need obviously need to know how, how it works and what's triggering our on show um, behavior that we see as we move up and down the page. And that's what these are, okay? If you notice in this interaction, we've got this pointers block over to the left-hand side. Those pointers, which are these tiny little lines sitting off the stage, are used to control both this flipping behavior that occurs on um, our uh, dates, as well as to show content progressively as we scroll. Two actions total that cause that for each of our, each of our content groups. There's a flip action at top, and what it does is it reaches up and it's grabbing uh, either button, button one, button two, that kind of thing. And it's adding some CSS to it to make it flipped. You can go without that if you so choose, no problem. 
Um, and then the second thing that it does, and this is really all we need, this is kind of the magic to this whole interaction, is when this little object right here, pointer one, which is up top, okay, or pointer two right here, right? When it scrolls out of view, okay, right here, scroll out of view, all we do is show date two. Now date two is this object right here, our date. So we go on down the page, pointer three, as we scroll out of view on pointer three, we're showing info box two. You can see that in your target group here. And that just continues as you go down the page. This is probably one of the simplest interactions in the wireframe set, um, because again, all we're doing is two actions on these individual little pointers off to the side of the screen, powers the whole thing. Cool part about that is if you decide, you know, okay, I want my 2018 box to be four times as long. Um, the only thing you really need to do there, aside from resizing your objects and rearranging the, thing, the items on screen below it, is to move the pointers that you have uh, off screen to whatever spot it is that makes sense for your content. So for instance, if I wanted the objects uh, associated with this pointer here, pointer four, okay, so pointer four flips one of these buttons and it also shows date three. If I, or if I wanted to change when date three uh, shows and flips, I basically would just grab that pointer, move it, a lot further down the page, right? and now that's going to show up a lot later as the user scrolls. If I wanted to show up earlier, all I got to do is grab that thing and move it further up on the page. And now when it scrolls out of view more quickly, my date will show up quickly as well. Other than that, there's actually just a static layout. There's nothing really going on in this layout other than the actions that are on those pointers. And we put everything on those pointers to make it so that you could kind of change, move, regroup things wherever you want and not have to rely on the individual objects on screens themselves moving in or out of view. Um, you could trigger uh, trigger the, the incoming and, and outgoing or transitions via another object, right? To make it a little cleaner for you, have a little more control. Uh, so yeah, so, so this one right there, right? Again, um, in context, this morning I went in basically did exactly what I showed you here. I grabbed this interaction from the library, dumped it into my course, uh, and then went in behind it into the background uh, and started adding a couple of images. Um, I restyled my shapes here just a little bit, added, changed the, the fill color, changed my stroke color, gave some you know opacity, 90% like transparency to these boxes behind it, and boom, I'm done. Um, in about maybe five minutes, right, of adding some images and doing some real quick edits using the style painter on a bunch of objects over and over again, I had taken that wireframe from a blank interaction to something that is a heck of a lot more finished and polished, um, again, with, with pretty much no effort, right? All right. So we're going to look at another one of these. I accidentally showed you that one first and I didn't mean to. I kept <laughs> grabbing the wrong thing from the time uh, from the library there. But now we're going to start back up at the top of the file. I'm going to show you this uh, this new one, this uh, new on scroll animation layout as well. Very similar idea to the timeline that we just had. In fact, you're going to see kind of the build is is real close. Um, but the difference here is that instead of having it as a timeline interaction, we've actually included um, you know, spots for you to include content, images, kind of larger overall areas to move, uh, to, to move your content around. There are two versions of this one on the library. There's a, a layout version, which is a little more finished, okay? And then there's actually a wireframe, a true wireframe version, which has placeholders in there for you, okay? So image placeholders, text placeholders, um, so you don't have to contend with anything that we've added to it, right? In the layout version, we put actual images in it. We put some text in it. We put a little bit of style in there, um, but in the this wireframe version that you're, you know, I've got highlighted or, or hovered over, there's absolutely none of that included. 
uh, in the wireframe. So you can truly start, start from scratch, but you still get that progressive reveal bit um, that, that looks real nice when you're done. I'm actually just gonna download this AWO right here, the, the more finished layout one, uh, because that's the one that I used this morning when I was seeing how rapidly we could get these to, to come together. When you download that, you're gonna see, like I was saying, right? This is um, kind of a, a nice long vertical scrolling layout with, there is some images in this one, there is some text in this one, um, but it's all kind of in these buckets, right? Over to the left-hand side, you're going to see a few different, yeah, you see this little pointer here, right? It's a scroll target. Same principle as the one I showed you previously. As this one scrolls out of view, we're going to show section two content. I go down here and I look at what section two content is. It's this entire chunk of content in the blue here. All right. Now, same thing if I look at scroll target two, Where's my action target there? Section three content, scroll target three. My action target there is scroll, section five content, right? Um, we've also got a scroll out of view for section four up here on scroll target two. So each of my actions are targeting groups in this particular interaction. In the previous one that I showed you, we were targeting individual objects, but in this one, we're targeting entire groups as I'm scrolling those off-screen scroll target shapes out of view. I'm showing groups of content lower down on the page. Now that's super convenient because then you can come in here and you can say, well, I wanna put 15,000 other things in this group beyond just the section image and section one text that eLearning Brothers has provided me, right? I wanna include some more images. I wanna include two or three more blocks of content. I want to include some background shapes in that particular section um, that I want to, you know, I, I want to show up at a, at a given time. Um, and those, those will work, right? Because we're targeting groups rather than particular objects in this case. If I take it up to the finished version that I, that I created earlier and I look at it, you, you can kind of see what I mean by that, right? So this version here, is significantly more complicated in terms of the way it looks than the wireframe layout that I had just brought into screen. And you notice there's more stuff going on. We've got, for instance, in this 50-50 layout, previously there was just text and image or a couple, maybe I think three elements total in this block, but I added an image as well as a chunk of content into that content group and it still works just as expected. Uh, same thing here, right? I've added multiple images into this third section. Um, I've got background shapes going. I've got some decorative elements going on. This content uh, text, you know, block is actually separate from this background shape just just because for for sake of showing you. Um, and it all it all works because it's all nested within that content three group. Um, so all you have to do is go in decide where you want your content on the page, put it into that particular group. Uh, and if you decide that, you know what, it's it's showing up a little slow, like right there, maybe that could happen a little sooner. Um, you just, same thing I was showing you previously, you go in, you find the uh, the off-screen marker that you wanna edit, right? You wanna change the timing on and you, you move that up or down the screen to change when your objects show or hide, okay? All right, the next one we're gonna look at is this vertical flip card piece. I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna go over to my tools here and I'm gonna find that in the library. Um, my flip cards are right here on the second row as of today. Uh, and you know, it's like I said, we've got a vertical flip card version. We've also got a horizontal flip card version. It's built identically, the exact same piece. The, the literally the only difference between the two is that in the vertical flip card, the, the background card itself flips up and the little button in the front flips to the side, uh, but in the horizontal version, that's reversed. So the button on the bottom flips up and the background card itself flips to the side. So uh, kind of six, one half dozen another in terms of which one we look at, I'm gonna go ahead and grab this vertical one. Uh, and like I'd said previously, there are multiple versions of this one. There's a light one and a dark one, just to give you kind of a quick head start on styling and to let you see what it looks like in a different uh, situation. 
So I'm gonna put this wireframe into my course. And when it comes over, easy peasy, right? I've got a few different things going on. I've got this reset variable uh, at the top uh, that happens on, on show, on page show. Um, what that's about, that's, that's kind of what I was mentioning earlier. Um, these use common variables um, across the course. All right, so if you were to copy and paste this block, this, this element, or uh, this page, or if you were to use, you know, the dark version on one page and the light version on another, um, they're using they're using common variables. So that could cause potentially some behavioral issues. But we go ahead and reset that variable at the very top of the page to make sure that every time you hit the page right, you're going to start fresh, start from zero. And um, what that variable does is it just toggles back and forth from zero to one to keep track of where you're at on the page, right? So. We go ahead and reset that at the beginning. Um, as with a bunch of these that have any flipping stuff, you're gonna see some CSS up at the top. You can largely ignore that unless you really wanna get into it. Um, it just contains the classes that we're using to give that, that nice little flip effect. Um, you can certainly go in and play with those if you'd like, but otherwise you could just ignore it. The actual behavior on this one, again, the, the build and behavior, remarkably simple for what it is. Um, we've just got this flip card background object back here, uh, standard lectora shape. So you can do with it as you please. You can change it to a pentagon, a pe you know, pentagon, or you can change it to a, you know, pill shape if you so choose, um, or you can just leave it as is, right? And up above it, once again, we've got two groups. We've got side one and side two group. Um, you can change what's inside those groups to your heart's content. If you wanna add 15 items into that one group, you can. And just like the last uh, interaction I was showing you, because we're targeting groups with our actions um, on the flip button there, it, it sh should work just fine, okay? So put a series of images in here, put a whole bunch of text, do whatever you need, dress it up, change, you know, add some decorative elements. They all appear because we're targeting side one or side two when we're doing some hide and show actions on our button down below. In fact, if I look inside that group, there's no actions inside the group whatsoever, just content, right? The actual power of this one comes from this single button right here. Doesn't really even take much to make the interaction run, just a few little actions. One, we're modifying a variable, like I was telling you before, to keep track of which side of the card we're on. It's either one or zero, depending on what the current value is. We're going to flip it to the opposite, just toggle it. And then after that, basically just hiding or showing those content groups, right? So show our hide side one. If that toggle variable I was telling you is set to one, and if it's not, hide side two. And we're going to flip. Flipping runs just a little bit of jQuery in here, okay? And what we do there is we're actually reaching out, we're grabbing the HTML name and kind of setting up some, some values for this individual object. And basically we're just toggling a class on our button and on our background object here, flipped up or flipped, okay? And then after that, we choose to show which content object we need to see. Same idea as the hide action previously. Um, depending, we're either going to show side one if our vertical flipper is equal to one, and if not, we're going to show. Or I'm sorry, we're going to show side two if vertical is uh, flipper is equal to one, and if not, we're going to show side one back and forth. Right. So that's the point of that toggle at the beginning, and then we're also going to set a state of our button here. Right. So we're going to set it to selected if vertical flipper is equal to one. And if it isn't, we're going to set it back to normal. Okay. And by doing that, we can get, you know, this kind of an interaction going on where uh, we've got a nice finished out page. All I did to change this one out was add a background image in here. Uh, I changed the fill color and opacity of my background card. And then you'll notice the content that's in it's pretty much the same as the wireframe. I've got a header, a subhead, text, and an image over to the right. I just restyled the font on that. And if I press flip, you'll see same thing on the other content. 
And then I restyled my button here to make it a little more in line with my theme. But again, this was maybe a 15 minute change probably. Um, I brought in my wireframe, did a couple quick little edits to style. What is it? Dropping an image, to, changing two images, changing the style of my text, changing the style of a button, right? Very rapid stuff. And I was able to go from my wireframe in this view to a finished version very, very, very quickly. Okay. All right. Just gonna keep plowing on ahead and going through these. Uh, so we took a look at the vertical timeline already. We can skip that one. The next one we're gonna look at is this carousel wireframe. Okay. Um, this one's this one's this one's pretty fun. I I I, I like this one a lot um, because there's something kind of neat going on in it, um, and we're starting to play with a little bit more of this as we go. Um, I would actually love to hear, you know, as you start seeing this type of thing appear off screen in some of these templates, I'd love to hear some, some people's opinions about it. But what, what we're starting to play with is we're starting to play with using some off screen variables or off screen objects to allow, to allow you to more quickly edit these templates, um, either the logic or in some cases, even the styling of some of these templates. We're using some off screen objects to help you with that. In this particular case, okay, you'll notice on the left-hand side here, we've got this number of content groups or objects, and that's set to six. You also notice that I've got six content groups down at the bottom. Well, what we're doing is we're actually using this, right, to set the number of rotations that we go through in the action that drives our carousel here. So we know which content group to show and then where to max out and loop back to the first one, right? Or the other way around, right? If we're going backwards, which one to go to after we're done with number one. You can go in and actually manually change that. You know, I wanna set it to four and now it's gonna run four cards. Set it to two, it's gonna run two. Um, if you do anything over six, you're obviously gonna have to add content groups and add actions to make that work. But we left it with six right now. Um, the, you know, the actual action of, of increasing the number on, on screen is, is, is really pretty, pretty simple. It's not a whole lot that we're doing to make it work. Okay. So let's break down what we are doing to make it work. Just like in the previous action or previous interactions, um, we've got a content block in the back here. It's this kind of a, you know, standard lectora shape, do whatever you want with it, change the shape, change the fill, change the style, you know, have fun with it. There's no actions tied to it whatsoever. Um, pretty much every action in this interaction is tied to your, um, your buttons here. You've got an intro content block, which only shows the first time you view the carousel. After that, it's hidden. Um, and we, we cycle through these content groups that are down here on the screen below. So um, kind of the same idea as before. Uh, since these are done in groups, you can add anything you want to them without breaking the interaction. You can add another 15 items into content group one if you want, or you can take away everything from it, but the interaction will still work. The animation will still work. What's going to show up, you know, it'll, it'll still show up. You open up those content groups, you'll see again, right? Just like I'm saying, no actions tied there. So you can add, remove, change as you need, and it's not going to break anything. Everything is instead tied to buttons. Now, if I go up to my forward button, we'll break through, we'll, we'll kind of break down the, the actual actions and triggers that we're using here. Um, everything's done on click, obviously. Uh, but what we're doing, the first thing we do is we're gonna set a, uh, this button, whatever we've clicked, disable very briefly. Um, we're doing that because, um, you know, things can get a little kind of clunky if users are trying to reinitiate an action before a transition has finished. It can kind of break the visual sometime. So to prevent that, the first thing we do once a user presses this button um, is we just disable the button for a short period of time to prevent them from reclicking it while our carousel is in motion, and therefore prevent them from, from breaking it. The next thing we do is we run this action group called show content actions. If I go and look at that, you're going to see a whole lot in there. <laughs> okay. Uh, first thing you're going to see is this get current position. 
What we're doing there is we're actually going up and we are grabbing the left and top position of this background card, right? These elements that we need to move um, and we're storing them to like to our variables, okay? Because we're gonna move this object across the page. Well, I don't know where you want that object to start. You might want, right, when we give you this template, we, we kind of set you right up in the middle of the page, but you may want to take this con th this card and you may want to move it all the way to the left of the page and up. Or you may choose to put it in one of these vertical page, you know, scrolling pages that we're talking about, um, you know, we're kind of having fun with lately. Um, and if you do that, there's really just no telling where on the page this content block is going to sit. So rather than rely on um, explicit values for where to move our content block in our carousel interaction, because remember this thing moves from left to right, we're just gonna immediately get the initial value of it. Where is it now? Store that into some variables in Lector so we know what to reference, okay? And then move through with our movement action. So after we've stored our variables up there, uh, we're doing some modification here to kind of reset um, what our, our actual move to position is, right? So we're getting a baseline for where our left position is, where our Y position is, our right, and, and uh, where we're moving our objects are. And we're kind of running through that in this stack of actions, okay? Once we're done with kind of establishing where we're coming from and where we're going to, you notice this card X right, it's got add to variable 350. Basically, we're taking that baseline value we established and we're adding 350 pixels to it. And that's now where it's going to move to. So it's a more dynamic way to do it rather than setting it explicitly, like I was saying before. Once we're done with setting up all these kind of move to variables and baseline variables, we start hiding and showing content like you would expect. We're going to hide our intro content first. Uh, we're going to fade our card out, fade our card back up. And then we're gonna start hiding content, um, the actual content blocks that we cycle through. We hide all of them, one, two, three, four, five, six to begin with. That way we don't have to necessarily uh, target, you know, a hide action with conditionals, just drop them all at once, get rid of them, and then show which one we need to show based on those conditionals. Just simplifies some of the development here by removing that, that conditional a bit. Show content one. If carousel counter is equal to one, you can expect show content two. If carousel counter is equal to two, um, basically we just move up the stack one through six, keeping track of our variable uh, carousel counter. And that gets set obviously when you press your button here, right? So after we run our show content actions, we're gonna move our background card. Uh, and if you'll notice when we move our background card, we're gonna move it to our card X left position uh, as our X position and our card Y left position as our Y position. These are the two, these are some of the variables that we set earlier up in that stack. Uh, and that kind of allows us again to move this dynamically without having to explicitly set a, uh, you know, like a certain value for X and Y. We're gonna move it right. And we're gonna move it middle. We've got three of these kind of actions that we're doing to create this look that we've got, and they're gonna occur based on what you're clicking and where. And then after that movement is done with, we re-enable that button so the user can click it again. Notice there's a 1.1 second delay on that. Uh, and that's just to accommodate the total time of the move that's going on in this background card, the transition that we've got, right? Which is just uh, you know, got a fade going on, and then we have the actual move itself, which you can see right here, right? Put those two things together, account for those, enable the button after that's all occurred, so 1.1 seconds. And then when that's all done, we're incrementing that carousel counter to keep track of where we are, right? And we do that all the way up through whatever this value is, so whatever our maximum value is here, um, if you put in a four, this is going to show up as a four. So once you hit four, the next time you click the button, we're going to reset our va variable value back to one and loop again. Okay. That's pretty complicated, but uh, it works. And, and the actual use of it's nice and simple. The back button is 
pretty much identical to the forward button, right? Um, and and I'm not gonna spend the time picking through it, but what I will do is I'm gonna take these guys and I'm gonna move them a little bit on the screen here. And we're gonna see if I didn't break it by doing that. Probably need to grab the right page. I just previewed the wrong one there. All right, hit pre page preview. And you'll notice now I didn't move my content, but if I had, that would show up in the right place. More importantly, what does show up, right, are my background cards, right? They're moving exactly where I repositioned them on the page um, without me having to go in and do any sort of adjustment to the actual actions um, on that page. Now, if I had taken my content blocks and moved those where I want them, they're just gonna hide and show immediately on top of that background card. So their position doesn't, doesn't matter so much, right? It works for card one title because content that's showing because I had that shown and I grabbed it when I moved it, you would just do the same for the other content blocks. Putting this into you know actual use, again, this was a, maybe another 15 minute execution, um, just like the rest of these. Um, all I did was, you know, download like we've just seen. I changed the background shape of my card. I also made it much wider and I moved my buttons to either side and restyled those, um, changed the style of the background ca uh, card. I added a quick little background image. And then I really just went in and, and started changing what was inside of those content groups. Um, didn't do a whole lot, right? Just dumped an image in change the position of my content boxes that are already in that content group. Um, and there's a bunch of different layouts, you know, in each one of these groups. I did that just so you can kind of see how simple, how easy it is to actually make these edits without breaking anything. It all works because it's working on those groups. All right. Now let me just try to barrel on through to the last two here. Uh, this vertical timeline one, right before we get into our notes one, notes, notes interaction, this is uh, kind of very similar again to the, the type of thing that we've been looking at here, a couple different elements put together in this one. Um, so to start with, right, we've got these just basic elements on the screen. Um, I'm going to move them down a little bit so it's easier to see. Notice that we're working again with some groups here right? Uh, as well as individual buttons. Um, the build on this one is a little more complicated in some ways because we're doing a few different things. Um, but you should start to see some similarities between this and, and kind of a couple of the other ones that I just showed you before. In this particular one, um, we've got the, I, I, everything's driven by the, clicking these individual buttons, right? So we'll start there before I go up into the, the, the action groups. So the first thing that we do on each one of these buttons uh, is we actually have a flip action that we run. It's the exact same flip action as we're running in the other um, flip cards that we I showed you previously, right? We're just going up, grabbing some information about this, this individual button, and we're adding a class to it. Again, that is here in your CSS. I don't want to scare you. You don't have to do anything with this. You don't ever even have to look at it, um, and it'll work. It, it you, you don't need to be a CSS person um, for Lectora whatsoever, um, but uh, we've been playing with it a little bit, so it made its way in here. Um, all that, however, could be removed if you choose not to deal with it, and these will all still work. You'll just have a slightly different, you know, kind of a, a, a visual aspect to, to your version, right? Um, yeah, so the, this, first inter, this first action here, all we're doing is toggling a class or adding a class to these buttons to make them flip. Same thing I showed you before. Ignore that one if you're doing any of the edits and this kind of stuff. Um, the next thing that we do is we're actually resetting some of these buttons uh, and resetting the position of some of these buttons by running this run action group called hide info boxes. If you go up here, right, hide info boxes, sounds exactly like what it is. We're basically just hiding our info boxes. Info boxes are the content that appears when you click one of these buttons on screen, okay? We hide one, two, three, four, five info boxes, all of them regardless, no conditionals. After that, we show visited states. 
So if I check that action group, you'll see show visited state for each one of my buttons. And the conditional on those are pretty much what you would expect, right? So if the variable that I'm, or if the, the uh, tracking variable for this particular timeline click to reveal is equal to one for button five, set it to visited. Same thing here. If button four's tracking variable is equal to one, set it to visited. And if not, don't. After that, we set the state of the individual object that we've just clicked to be uh, active or disabled uh, in this case. Um, but it looks like it's active, but what we're actually doing is setting it to a disabled state so the user can't repeatedly kind of click on that one and not cause any issues. Then we choose to show the content, right? And this is per button. So on button one, we're going to show info box one, button two, we're going to show info box two, et cetera. All that's going to do is just bring up our content block here. Then we're going to set our tracker, right? So timeline C2R tab tracker set equal to one. And we're going to run a move group. Now this move to new button, okay? You'll notice it works in kind of a similar way to what I was showing you previously on the carousel. We're actually moving to uh, some variables rather than explicit values for these buttons, okay? So move to whatever the new position that our variables have set are, okay? And then we're gonna run a very similar action to what you've seen before and just check and set some position stuff, okay? Just to make sure that everything moves where it needs to be easily, goes back to where it needs to be without you having a fool with it. And that also means that you can grab all these objects, rearrange one, rearrange many, and it'll all still work the same way as it does when we give it to you. Those actions are repeated across all of our buttons here. They're really doing nothing different. Um, it's just, you yeah, click it, we're running some variables, hiding an info, hiding all of our info boxes, showing one info box, and then moving our buttons based on those variable values that we've set up. Again, you know, we're working on content blocks here, our groups. So if you wanted to, you could go in and add an image to info box one group. You could add 15 images to info box one group. I keep using that number today. Um, you do whatever you want with it, right? Uh, and it, it should still work. They'll all show up up here and, you know, um, not break, I guess is the important part. One difference between this one and the previous one, uh, is ones that we've been looking at where we've got, we're working just on these groups is that inside of this one, we do have a button in this group, a close button um, that does a few things. It resets the position of our objects, right? Rather than duplicate all of that effort, it just is running our hide info box um, action group. So everything is repetitive, you know, kind of easy reuse. Hides itself runs the show visited state action um, so that we can, so if the previous button was clicked, we'll show that that was clicked and set it to a visited state. And then it runs the move group again, right? So taking advantage of Lectora's you know, uh, action groups here in a couple different ways to, to make sure that we don't have to repeat actions over and over and over again on multiple objects or on groups, okay? So uh, again, you know, a little bit more of a complicated build on this wireframe, but the use is equally as simple. Um, on this one, I went in, again, maybe another 15 minute build at most. Uh, I just took a couple background objects, threw them in the back of my page, put some decorative stuff in there with some animations. This one, I didn't want to run any images. I just want to keep it kind of, you know, color shapes nice and plain. Uh, and then I just restyled my, my boxes. And to do that, I, I ran the style painter um, in, you know, off the home tab, just select the button that I want to style it to. And then paint that style onto all my other buttons. It took me 30 seconds to restyle each one of these buttons by doing that, uh, and they come out consistently. Did the same thing with the background, uh, you know, blocks for my content groups here. Same thing with the close button, right? Run that style painter over and over and over again uh, so that they're all consistent. And I save a bunch of time doing it. Now, I did see, uh, happened to catch, you know, come across my eye while I was talking here, um, a question, I believe about 508 stuff. Um, you know, on these, these are, these are kind of non-typical interactions. Um, so these are not, we're not leading with, um, 
you know, WCAG 508 compliance on these necessarily, but what we have done uh, in, in them is we've tried to at least factor that in to the way that we've built um, them. Now, um, how valuable that is to you and, and your needs, you know, for your organization, I, I can't say because, you know, that's, that's a pretty tricky bit there, right? Um, but what we've done is we have added a skip nav for you. Um, we have added, um, uh, we've kind of made sure that we paid attention to, you know, tab order. Contrast in the wireframes is kind of a non-issue because they're largely black and white, right? We've, we've done a lot of that legwork to, to at least get you to the point where you can certainly make it so if the interaction um, is in fact a, a compliant interaction. Um, so hopefully that addresses that question. Uh, what I do want to go ahead and look at the last one um, before I was just going to say, I'll take some more questions in a second here, but I realized that I need to go show you these notes. I didn't do that yet. The notes, uh, the notes object that we've got in here, this little calling it a widget. Um, I'm, I'm particularly fond of, okay. Uh, I'm fond of it for a couple of reasons. One, because it's, it's, it's truly like a drag and drop thing. Okay. Um, I've got another clean version of a course starter that we're working on right now. This is a curated course starter. You'll notice it matches the style of what we've been showing you today, these finished versions. Um, this should come out, I think, next week. It's real nice, clean, pretty, you know, modern course starter. Let's just pretend this is your course and your course starter, and you want to add a notes widget to this object or to this, this course starter. Um, the way that we've got this thing built out is remarkably simple to do. Um, you just select what point in your project you want that notes pane or that notes widget to be added. Um, in my case, I want it to be global and I want it to be over top of my navigation to overlap it when it's exposed. Uh, so I'm selecting my nav object as my last selected object. And then I'm going to insert an AWO of this notes widget into my course and it should go right after my nav object, right? So let me scroll down here and hit view more on my wireframes. And then I'm going to grab this notes widget that I've got, this uh, notes entry widget Lector desktop. And right after my nav pane, I've now got some stuff, right? Add it in. Um, now, what you will see here, okay, uh, we've got a notes pane and we have an edit notes button. Um, everything on this, and this is a pretty complicated one, and we could probably spend a lot of time going through it, but everything on this, um, in, in terms of what we're doing, it's all, it's all actually, it's all pretty simple stuff, right? Uh, it's a complicated little, little piece, but the actions that are, that we take to, to actually, you know, create this thing are, are remarkably simple. I'm going to barrel through them. Uh, and if we, we need to give more time to it, we can at another point, but I at least want to kind of just generally show you how it, it works. Um, cause again, I, I, I really like this one. I think it's interesting. Um, we've got this little notes button or I'm sorry, this little edit notes button thing that's persistent. So once you drop this widget at the top of your course, that edit notes bu uh, button is going to find itself to the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Uh, and it is going to be anchored to the bottom of your screen. Um, cause this entire widgets object is, is set up to be offset from bottom. So if you've got a real long page, it's going to go to bottom left. If you get a real short page, it's going to go to bottom left when you publish. That's just the way it's going to work. You can change that however you want, but that's how it made sense for us to set up. First thing it does is it's actually going to uh, it's actually going to modify a view or edit uh, variable that we keep track of to know whether you're viewing or editing your notes, right? Uh, and then it's going to set the current page. It's going to set this little uh, variable that we're keeping track of to be whatever the current page name is. Okay. Um, and then it's going to keep track of max characters. All right. What that is, is, is basically we've got down here, you know, we've got a little a notes entry pane and in it, uh, we've set a maximum of 250 characters in our field. Um, but you can change that to whatever you want. We did 250 because that's a, you know, sometimes a it's a limit for Swarm or ACC, right? Um, you can change that to 500, you change it to 1,000, put it whatever you want. Um, but we go, rather than kind of manually setting that anywhere else for you or putting it in text here, because we have this little notification for your users that shows how many they have remaining. 
Um, rather than making any direct reference to that, we're just basically going in and grabbing some variables and then re resetting those up as variables, right? So next thing that we're gonna do is when you click that edit button, we're actually gonna run an action to show this notes pane down here, which is this entire content block, right? Uh, and hide the edit button itself. In the actual notes pane, if I take a look at this, right? I've got this character count right there. Okay, what we're gonna do on that particular object, you'll notice a few actions to it. Um, we're gonna go ahead and update um, the notes character to this notes character variables, reset it at all times. And then we're gonna attach um, the input ID, all right, for this field down at the bottom to a variable. And we're also going to attach a maximum variable count. Okay, so we're gonna pull that from here and then add it into our notes characters up at the top. Every time a user clicks and makes a key press, um, we're basically gonna update that character count. We're gonna do a little bit of magic up at the top that you don't need to worry about. And it's going to update that var notes character count to count down with how many characters you have remaining. Um, and it's also going to set a maximum for that area. The rest of the stuff in here is all real simple stuff, right? When you hit the close notes button, we're going to hide things. We're going to save your, your notes that you've committed. We're going to repeat that action pretty similarly uh, in the save note button here. Um, and, and we're also going to do some toggling stuff with the view notes. Basically what's going on there is anything you type into this field, whenever you close or save, uh, that, that element is gonna be committed to a variable called notes summary. And it's gonna be displayed back to the user whenever they press this view notes button, All right? Show notes summary without animation, all right? Um, we do go ahead and like I was you know, showing you at the top of it, we're keeping track of what, what page you're on and that's going to get injected at the top of the user note so that they're going to have a nice organized, you know, on this page, I typed this kind of a view and they can look at that whenever they want, however they want. Okay. Uh, if I were to go up here and hit page preview on my course starter and look at this just, you know, immediately dropped in. Uh, I didn't uh, I didn't correct the, the location on it, so let's go back and look at that in a uh, spot where I don't need to do that. If I were to preview this real quick, kind of dropped in there, you'll see, right, I've got my edit button on the bottom left. When I select that edit button, uh, my notes pane comes up, tells me how many characters I have left. I can go in and say, you know, how many character is left and it looks like I've got at this point 229 right so I can hit now it's 226 because I typed three more I can hit save right my characters reset themselves back to 255 back I can save here again and at any point I can view what I've done right as I progress through my pages this notes for value is going to update and my, my uh, notes will be tied to that. And again, like I was showing you at the top of it, I can press print at any time if I want to as well and print these out in a nice organized fashion too. Okay, so uh, I did a lot of talking for the last 58 minutes. Um, and it looks like maybe we have a couple questions down there. At least I'm seeing some red, red bubbles. Um, do we have any questions we should address, Stephanie, or are we slap out of time today? We have um, a couple questions that we could maybe squeeze in really okay. quickly. Okay. So for that flip card example you showed, if you wanted to change the direction of the flip, I know you showed it being kind of like a vertical flip. Could you make it a horizontal flip? And how would you do that? Yeah. So the way I would do it, truthfully, is to I would just download the horizontal version on the library and start from there because it just saves That's you a it. lot of time. Yeah. Again, just go into tools. We got the vertical version and you got a horizontal version. And in each one of those, you got a light version and a dark version just to save you a little bit of time. Perfect. All right. We did everything for you.
Uh, with the vertical scroll example, could you show us what it looks like when it's set for fit to window when published? Um, yeah, actually. So um, let me show you this. So the vertical scroll example, okay, if I were to go, for instance, um, just frankly, this will actually just be quicker, if you don't mind. If I were to go to our product showcase, okay, um, I'm pretty sure, unless I'm wrong, and if I am, we'll connect after this. Um, but I thought I had this one published at Fit to Window, but I don't. Um, I did at one point. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it, it functions if that's the, if that's the, <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, that's pretty much the yeah, it. It works. It'll work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's not tied to a specific you know um, like a pixel value on the screen. It's 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 all proportional. So it it as you you publish it, it 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 should still function fine. And if for some some reason it doesn't, which it we've tested it and it certainly has, please let me know, right? And we'll make sure that that it does. All right, awesome. We are right at time. Well, actually, now we're a minute over. So I'm going to cut that off there. But if you need any more questions answered, feel free to reach out to Bill or the Rockstars community. That's a great place to connect with other Lectora developers and find out what they're doing and how you can do things as well. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. This webinar is recorded. So we'll be getting that out to everyone via email tomorrow. And we hope to see you on our next one. Thank you. Mm -hmm.